So we're gonna start with disc disease. And when you collect a history on this patient, they're primarily going to be complaining about extremity pain as opposed to back pain. When you examine them, they may have some focal motor weakness in a specific muscle group. If they have general weakness where both legs are weak in every muscle group, that may be more pain limited. And paresthesias, so pins and needles, loss of sensation, that's usually in a specific dermatome because it's a specific nerve that's compressed. In order to image this and diagnose it, we want to look at the nerves themselves. And in order to do that, you, that's best done with an MRI because one of the first things you're taught in radiology uh, 101 is an MRI gives you soft tissue, a CT and an X-ray give you bones. And that's why the MRI shows us compression or stenosis of the nerves. Sometimes you can't get that because different sorts of stimulators and uh, uh, pacemakers are becoming very popular uh, and common in the population. So if you can't get an MRI, then you get a myelogram, which is basically an intradural injection of contrast dye and then a CT. But the CT won't give you the answer for this alone. The x-ray can be useful for operative plan because that shows us alignment and instability and helps us to determine fusion versus simple decompression. And again, these are different dermatomes. So you wanna ask a patient when you collect a history, where is this extending into your leg? The front, back, side, uh, medial aspect and how far down is it going. All of that helps you to isolate which nerve is actually the trigger for this pain. So once you diagnose through history, exam and imaging a, a disc problem or disc disease, the question is, what do you do about it? So isolated disc disease, so a herniated disc, about half the time over the course of one month, that will actually reabsorb the pressure will get better and the symptoms will get better over the course of one month. So if somebody, a patient will often use the term sciatica, radiculopathy, that basically is just referring to the electric pain from a nerve that's compressed. And that's gonna get better over the course of a month. So unless there's a severe dire deficit, we're actually not gonna do anything. Uh, we're going to tell the patients, let's wait and see how this evolves. Steroids are very helpful because they decrease inflammation, edema, and that will make patients feel a lot better as a bridge to when this goes away on its own. NSAIDs are good as well. Injections can sometimes help to facilitate a diagnosis because if you do a selective nerve block where a pain management doctor puts a needle and, and anesthetizes a specific nerve, if the patient doesn't get better, well, then we know that nerve's not the problem. If they do get better, then that implicates a nerve as the, the problem, the trigger for the pain. Opioids are less helpful here because opioids, aside from the opioid epidemic and the risk of chronic opioid use, I don't like to use opioids for disc disease for what is often a temporary problem. Steroids are, are much more helpful. So when we do get to surgical management, so in the 50% of patients that have that herniated disc and the symptoms don't go away, the minimally invasive discectomy is the most common form of management. So what we're looking at here, this is an MRI. This is a sagittal view. It means we're looking in basically sideways into the body. And you can see I know this pointer is not great, but hopefully you can see it a little bit. So this is the bone, right? The perfect square. And these are the discs in between the bones. And what you can see here is these are good, healthy discs. You see how this is hyper intense? It's a little bright here. And it's a little darker uh, at the edges of the disc space. So that's a nice, healthy disc. It's hydrated. As you get lower, there's more stress. So disc disease is common lower in the lumbar spine. You can see they're darker. These are dehydrated discs that are starting to collapse. And as they collapse, sometimes disc material can herniate or bulge out into the cistern. When that happens, it pushes on nerve roots. That's the stenosis part. So that's a herniated disc causing stenosis. For a discectomy in this case, some surgeons will do it open. Some surgeons will do it minimally invasively through a very small incision. What we do is we put a little tube down. That tube maintains our exposure. So fat and muscle don't herniate into the surgical field. And we drill off a little bit of the bone 
access this disc material and simply pull it out. That usually provides instant relief for the patient because as soon as that disc material is gone, the nerve's not irritated, they feel better right away. They'll usually go home on the same day, they're able to walk right away because the incision's small, there's usually very minimal surgical pain. Patients can go back to work pretty early. There are restrictions on weightlifting because if there is a hole in the annulus, which is basically the barrier that prevents the disc from bulging out, if the patient strains too much too soon, you can basically eject more disc material and have the same problem. It's important before this surgery to ask a patient, what's going on with your back pain? Because the leg pain, that radiculopathy pain shooting into the leg, that gets better. Back pain does not get better. Back pain is from arthritis, joint pain, bone pain. That doesn't get better by decompressing nerves. So this won't really have any impact on back pain. Sometimes the pain in the area is so severe, it, it radiates and patients will say their back pain's better. But generally speaking, this is not a treatment for back pain. everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.